during COVID. Are you doing it right? Uh, my name is Alina Gilbert, and it's nice to see that we have a lot of folks on this webinar because I think this is a really, really important topic, especially right now when we're all trying to do elections and hold our annual meetings. Let me, um, I'm going to go through just some housekeeping things, but while I do that, you guys entertain yourself with this funny picture. Um, so for those of you who have not done webinars before, the majority of your screen should be the PowerPoint, right? So you should be seeing that picture. Me, the presenter, hello. I am down in the corner, on the right-hand corner, or wherever you put me. And on your left side is uh, a column for you to be able to type in your questions. If you have questions as I'm going through this, yes, by all means, please type them in. I will not go through the questions until the end of the presentation because there's quite a few things to get through and I wanna make sure we have time to get through everything and then I'll go through the questions. Uh, CMCA credits, for those of you who need them, they are automatically generated. You will get them in the next day or so. They'll be emailed over to you. If it's been a couple of days and you don't see the email, please feel free to reach out uh, to my to me, or you can reach out to uh, education at altitude.law. Uh, you'll reach Sean, who is um, our education administrator, and he can help you out with that as well. While we're doing the webinar, if you're having any technical difficulties, please don't type your questions or concerns in on this question area. I can't help you from where I'm sitting. I would ask that you either pick up the phone and call Sean directly at 303-991-2076 or email education at altitude.law. Okay? Because if you send it to me, I'm just gonna stare at him and say, I don't know what to do. I am not an IT person. Anyone who's dealt with me knows I'm not an IT person. So without further ado, shall we get started? So the reason this was supposed to be a different topic originally, this presentation, and we changed it. We changed it to the current topic because it is quite clear to me that people are struggling. People are really struggling with not only how do we hold annual meetings, how do we do the virtual meeting thing, but the bigger issue right now is how do we elect directors to the board? Do we elect directors to the board? How does this all work you know, amidst COVID and virtual meetings? So I wanted to have a presentation specifically tailored to that issue. And I know there's a lot of other questions that come with you know, having virtual meetings. And we did do a virtual meeting webinar uh, about a month, month and a half ago maybe. And that is on the YouTube channel for Altitude Community Education. And you can watch that there. But today I wanna to talk specifically about elections and how we handle that. So I feel like before we can start talking about elections, we do need to look at the general picture, okay? Uh, as far as, let's look at meetings first, very quickly. So meetings of the unit owners as members of the association shall be held at least once each year. This is a site from Kiowa, so that's the legal citation there, it's section 308, subsection one. And it does say that meeting of the unit owners must be held at least once a year. This could be physically, this could be virtually. I have had a lot of communities ask me, if we postpone our annual meeting, are we in violation of this? And although maybe technically we might be, given the circumstances of today and the COVID status and all the governor's orders and all the uh, additional orders we have from individual counties, I cannot imagine a judge would fault an association for postponing the annual meeting and not having it exactly within the 12 month period. So although you should be aware this is a requirement and I don't want anyone to flat out cancel their annual meeting, 
I feel that postponing the annual meeting is justifiable. So the next question is, do elections have to take place during these annual meetings? And the Nonprofit Act speaks to that, and that's a citation of the Nonprofit Act, and it says, all directors shall be elected, appointed, or designated as provided in the bylaws. So that right there means when you as community managers or you as board members are looking at having your elections, whether virtually, whether by mail or whatever else, you need to also look in your bylaws, and I would recommend you look in all your governing documents to see if there's anything in there that's weird or something that you wouldn't expect to be in there or something that dictates a process for how you have to hold your elections, okay? Most of the time, you're just going to find language telling you, you know, um, that the directors have to be elected for these terms, here's the qualification of being a director, that type of a thing. So normally you're not going to find anything that dictates specifically the process, but you know what, you may. So absolutely you should be looking at that. And then we have another Nonprofit Act provision that says, unless otherwise provided by your bylaws, any action that may be taken at any annual, regular, or special meeting of members may be taken without a meeting through an action by written ballot. The term written ballot, uh, I need you to be aware that a written ballot is the same thing as a mail ballot. The term mail ballot is not used in the statute. We refer to it as a mail ballot because it seems to make more sense that way. When I say, if I just say a written ballot, well, technically, if you're at a meeting and you're filling out a ballot, that's also a written ballot. So it's just confusing with that terminology. So we refer to it as a mail ballot. Statute refers to it as a written ballot. But again, I wanted this up here because I wanted you all to see that we do have statutory authority to anything we would vote on in a meeting that we can vote on through a mail ballot, unless your bylaws uh, provide otherwise, which I have never seen. All right, so those were kind of the general provisions. Let's talk a little bit about legal requirements for elections in general. Condominium Act. We hardly ever refer to the Condominium Act. Why? Because most of it has been overridden by Kiowa and no longer applies. All right. However, there are still a couple of provisions that do apply. And one of them is this, uh, the requirement that directors serve staggered terms where one third or at least one third of the positions expire every year. Now, Kiowa does have language superseding that, but only for post Kiowa communities. So this will apply to a condominium community that was created before July 1, 1992. Okay, uh, if you have a community like that, you're managing one and you sit on the board of one and you're thinking, oh my gosh, we do not have staggered terms, make sure you consult with your community's attorney as far as what needs to happen to bring you into compliance with that and if it can happen. Uh, but you should be aware of that requirement. So then we have Kiowa. And Kiowa says, and we all know this, right? Contested elections require secret ballots, except for delegate voting. All right, so first of all, what's a contested election? A contested election is when we have more people running than the positions we have available. So we have one open board seat, we got five people running. We have two open board seats, we've got three people running. Anytime, even one extra person makes it a contested election. But note, for del it's an, there's an exception for delegates. So with some of the master plan communities that are out there, if you manage those or sit on the board of those, and the board is elected by delegates who vote on behalf of their constituents, in that case, there is not a requirement that you have uh, secret ballots. So that makes it a little bit easier if you're holding a virtual meeting uh, for election during a delegate vote, because then you can elect without using secret ballots and that simplifies things a lot. 
Next, ballots shall be counted by a neutral third party or committee of volunteers. This is another one I, I think is worth spending a few minutes on. I have had quite a bit uh, of questions coming in from community managers saying, so people are sending their ballots to our office, are we allowed to count these ballots? Because we don't have a physical meeting, we don't have any volunteers, um, are we allowed to count them? So to figure that out, like I looked further into what Kaiwa says, and Kaiwa says that a neutral third party, first of all, a neutral third party is not a defined term. There is nothing in Kaiwa that says, here's a list of neutral third parties. So on one hand, can community managers uh, fall under that you know, status as a neutral third party? I think arguably they can. Why would a community manager not be neutral, right? So I think at a minimum, you should be able to count the ballots as a neutral third party, as a community manager. However, and I would never recommend doing this if we were in an actual physical meeting because we really would prefer that it not be the community manager who counts the ballots. The committee of volunteers. A committee of volunteers in Kiowa says that it is a group of unit owners that are selected during an open meeting. And these unit owners cannot be board members and they cannot be uh, people who are running for the board. So the committee of volunteers does refer specifically to homeowners. Now granted, we do not have, we may not be holding a meeting where we can ask for uh, specific volunteers. But if you are holding a virtual meeting, you can definitely ask for volunteers. And that means those volunteers are gonna come down to the management office or wherever the ballots are getting mailed and they're gonna count. And I, I prefer that. If that's something that you can get volunteers for, that would be my recommendation, do it that way. And take yourself as a community manager out of you know the picture. But if not, I still think we can have the community manager count as a neutral third party. Who else can be a neutral third party though? Well, I've seen associations have uh, someone from the CPA firm they work with come and count ballots. Uh, that's, that seems to work as well. And I suppose you could hire someone for the purpose of coming in uh, and counting ballots. That's, that, those are all feasible neutral third parties. But remember that the committee of volunteers does have to be home. All right, last but not least, Kiowa says, association owned units are not allowed to vote. And this is only for post Kiowa communities. So if you have a community, you're managing a community, you're sitting on the board of a community that's that was created before July 1, 1992, and the association owns a unit, that's fine. You can cast votes on behalf of that unit as, as a board. If it was post July 1, 1992, and the association owns any units, those units cannot vote, okay? All right. So those are our statutory requirements. Let's talk about now, I wanna play out a scenario of what used to happen in kind of the old days when we were actually allowed to be outside and in groups and without face masks. Do you guys remember those days? It's kind of hard to think that far back, but you know, they were in existence at one point. We had physical meetings, right? And what did we do? How did we handle our physical meetings at the time? Well, you would have a check-in. You know, your homeowners would show up, and the community manager and someone else from the management company would be sitting there and they'd require you usually, you know, to sign in by your address or your name. And if you had proxies, uh, the homeowner would submit the proxies and they would get ballots in exchange for the proxy so they could vote them. And then they'd have to sign in on behalf of the proxy issuer person. But anyway, there was something in writing where we would be signing in and checking in and then we would establish the quorum. Um, so if you recall, most of the time a community manager or someone will come in and say, we have reached a quorum. We have 
you know, this many homes represented, quorum is this many homes, so we've exceeded that. We have reached a quorum, which means we can conduct business. Uh, you conduct, I mean, you do your thing, and then when it was time for the election, normally I saw candidates would stand up and introduce themselves, talk about kind of why I want to be on the board. This is what I think I can bring to the board. Um, and sometimes the folks in the audience could ask questions uh, to clarify and, and just uh, to get a better idea of who these candidates were. After that, we would have uh, the meeting host, or I shouldn't even say the host, the chair of the meeting, uh, ask, that, are there any nominations from the floor before we close this up, right? Remember, are there any nominations from the floor? So this is coming up more and more right now where people are pushing back and questioning, do we have to allow nominations from the floor? So for example, if we're doing a virtual meeting and we have two candidates for two positions, can't we just do an acclamation vote and not open it up to the floor? The answer is probably not. Why? Okay, here's why. One is, well, there's a few reasons. One is, it is a homeowner meeting, it's a membership meeting and members, and it's to conduct membership business. And that means we have to allow motions from the floor. The, so anyone could make a motion to nominate an additional person to the board. Even if the chair doesn't ask, are there any nominations from the floor? Someone could say, I motion that Bob Smith be nominated as a candidate for the board. And, and we can't stop that. Uh, so that's kind of one reason. The other reason is, absent anything in your documents, obviously, anyone has the right to run for the board. And that right to run for the board can be further qualified in your bylaws, which set forth uh, the qualifications. So for example, if your bylaws say you can't serve on the board if you're delinquent, if you're a member that's not in good standing, if you don't live in the community, right? I've seen bylaws say that. That is a qualification. And so if we are going to tell people they can't, um, they can't nominate themselves or nominate others from the floor, that is really somewhat of a qualification. Because what we're saying is you have to be nominated or you have to nominate yourself within some specific nomination period that has a start and an end and you can't nominate yourself. You're not qualified then to be nominated after that period. It really is a qualification. So Kiowa says, Boards cannot amend their bylaws to change qualifications without homeowner approval. So even if you have a set of bylaws that says the board can amend these bylaws, you know, by a board vote, it's still going to be trumped by the portion of Kiowa that says, no, you can't. You cannot establish director qualifications as a board. The homeowners have to approve that. So that is not a modification a board can make right? It would have to present it to the homeowners. Uh, the other issue is, if we take it a step further, it is really creating a power for the board if we say the board can create a nomination period. Because there's nothing that says they have that power, absent that language. So we would say something like the board can create a nomination period during which times, you know, all nominations must be submitted and there, the board is not obligated to accept any nominations outside of that period, something like that. That's a power. And board powers also require homeowner approval if we're going to add a power to the board. And most of the time that power really needs to be in the covenants which have a much higher approval requirement than the bylaws do. So you can see that in a Generally speaking, unless your bylaws or your declaration or your article specifically say that the board can create nomination periods or limit the time for nominations, it's not an inherent right to do. And so you do have to allow nominations from the floor. 
when we start talking about mail ballots, you'll see that equates to having the right in candidates and so leaving, having some blanks in the actual mail ballots. Same thing, right? Okay, so that is a physical meeting. And I think we're all familiar with that. Oh, well, there we go. So if you didn't have a contested election during uh, your physical meeting, if you wouldn't do a vote, it'd be an acclamation, two people, two positions. Okay, we're done. If you had a contested election, we use secret ballots. And those would either be distributed, usually they were distributed at check-in. So basically, you know, you would give a person, the homeowner checking in their ballot. If they had proxies, you would take the proxies and give them ballots instead. And the secret ballots have no identifiable marks. In other words, we can't, by looking at the ballot itself, identify who voted it. And we really shouldn't even be able to narrow it down. So again, we don't want to like color code them where, you know, like for example, yellow is from this street, purple is from that street. We don't want to narrow them in any way, shape or form. They should all be the same and they should have no identification on them at all. So the homeowners would then fill out these secret ballots. You would have probably your counters collect them, right? You get these volunteers and not current members, not candidates, no managers, no attorneys. I put that on there because if you do have a physical meeting, we do not encourage managers or attorneys uh, to count the ballots. So that's why that's on there. And the ballots would be counted and then the results would be announced. And we would adjourn the meeting and everybody would go home, some happy, some not, and that would be the end of that, right? So with physical meetings, it was pretty clear we knew how it was going to run. We knew how to conduct these elections. So how does it work with virtual meetings? Oh, goodness, it's very different, right? Well, the check-in, you still have to have a check-in and obviously you're not gonna have a physical sign-in sheet, so there's gotta be a mechanism in place for check-in. You're still gonna have to establish quorum. Proxies, what happens with proxies? So under Kiowa, we cannot prohibit proxies. We have to allow proxies to come in. Does that mean an association has to provide a proxy form to its homeowners? No, there's nothing that requires that, but we have to allow proxies. So if a homeowner shows up, uh, shows up, uh, gets to us a copy of their proxy and it was written on a napkin, as long as we can identify who it's from, who it's to, the proxy's dated and signed, it's a proxy and we're gonna have to honor it. So for that reason, I think most associations uh, and management companies do provide proxy forms because at least then we know it's correct and it's easier to read and we don't have to worry about it. So how do you handle proxies at a virtual meeting? Well, a lot of your virtual meeting policies say, you know, you have to either email it, you have to uh, hand deliver it, you have to mail it, it has to get, somehow you have to get it to the manager before the, the actual meeting starts, right? And then uh, it's up to the community manager, whoever is you know, in charge of hosting this meeting to go through the proxies and kind of figure out what's what. So we get to our annual virtual meeting and we have a quorum, we've established we have a quorum of, of owners present, uh, either they're on the, on the Zoom or whatever virtual conference or they have submitted proxies from other homeowners, which means legally they're considered to be present and we have a quorum. So if we have an uncontested election, again, that's easy. We don't need to do anything. We've got two people running, two people, uh, I mean, two positions open, they're automatically on, it's an acclamation. You do still have to open the Florida nominations as we just talked about. So assuming nobody nominates anyone from the floor, it stays. and. Uh, an uncontested election, and you um, can get on by acclamation. And you know, it's it's not funny; it's more sad funny. But I actually had a manager call me, and she was so distraught because they had exactly two positions, two people running. They held the annual meeting, and some guy who didn't even really want to be on the board. Um, he just thought it would be like fun when they asked for nominations from the floor volunteered himself. 
And so basically then they had to go through the whole contested election process because of it, where they could have just ended it there. So it was, it was very frustrating for the board. It was very frustrating for the community manager, but it is um, unfortunately something you might have to deal with. So what do we do with contested elections? So we know it has to be a secret ballot, right? And that's really where all the confusion comes in. So how do you allow homeowners to vote on a Zoom meeting or other type of virtual meeting uh, secret? How do you do that? And how do we vote the proxies secretly, right? Most, I shouldn't say most, the most associations that I deal with uh, currently do not utilize virtual meeting platforms that allow for secret voting. And what would you need to have in order to have secret voting? Well, the platform would have to allow each owner to have their own identifiable, you know, code to get in, an ability to vote, and then submit their votes. And so, and, and to, um, the platform would have to be able to avoid abuse so nobody can vote twice. It would have to allow someone to vote on behalf of whoever issued them a proxy. So they'd have to have another code for the proxy. So, I mean, you see what I'm getting to. And then at the end, this program would have to be able to tabulate all the votes and tell us who got the most votes. However, the other kind of issue with that is, under Kiowa, homeowners are entitled to inspect proxies and ballots for up to one year after the vote. So if we have a virtual election, how, and a homeowner comes and says, I want to see the ballots, will this virtual platform allow us to print out all the ballots that were submitted, even though they were submitted electronically? Uh, I think those are very difficult things to find, although possible. I, have, I do know a few associations that kind of upgraded uh, what they're using. They put in a few thousand dollars to do it and they upgraded their platform to allow for this type of voting virtually. If you can do that during your virtual meeting and you have upgraded and you have the capability to let homeowners vote secretly, the way we just talked about, then by all means, please use that. Please, that, that definitely makes life easier because then you get the election results right away, computer tabulates it, they pop up, we know who's elected, we ensure and we go home, we're done. However, if you are like most community associations right now and don't have that kind of a platform that allows homeowners to secretly vote, okay, the only other option for a secret election or secret ballot election is an action by written ballot. So remember earlier on in this webinar, we said, I, I read you that portion of the Nonprofit Act that said anything that can be done at a meeting may be done by a written ballot. Remember we said that? So that's what this would be. Okay, this would be the written ballot. Now, I wanna make it very clear that an action by written ballot, and we'll talk about this more as we go on, is not part of the meeting. The biggest confusion I have seen recently is the confusion that between what's part of the, this virtual meeting we had and what's part of the election. And the thing is you gotta draw that line in the sand because the meeting, the virtual meeting gets adjourned and it's done, okay? And everything that went with that meeting, including the proxies, are part of the meeting and they're not part now of the election because we're using a separate statutory process for the election. We're using the mail ballot system and um, Sorry, I'm trying to advance here. And um, there are very specific statutory requirements when it comes to using a mail ballot. So it becomes very clear if you're reading through the Nonprofit Act that using a mail ballot or a written ballot as they refer to it is not part of the meeting. It's a whole separate thing. So we're really talking about two separate legal processes, processes. Yes, I think that was the correct way. A snobby way to say it, process seeds. So when once the meeting, the virtual meeting is adjourned, it's done. 
you, 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 I don't want to say forget about it, but I mean the election is going to be a completely separate action, not part of the meeting. So with respect to elections by written ballot slash mail ballot, we do have, like I said, a whole bunch of legal requirements, and these are in the Nonprofit Act. So the one is you got to deliver the written ballot to every member entitled to vote. I underlined deliver and I underlined every, and I'll tell you why. So the deliver I underlined because it doesn't say by mail, if you notice. So hypothetically, we can deliver the written ballot in any way we want, whether it's hand delivery, whether it's via email uh, or some other mechanism. However, I think you're going to see as we go through this that delivering it through email is probably not the not going to be the way to go with a secret ballot. And then I underlined every because I have had associations come to me and say, okay, so we're going to do this mail ballot. We're going to send out the ballot to everyone who was at the virtual meeting. And I said, what do you mean? Just the people who are at the virtual meeting, you got to send it to everyone. And they say, but they, the, not everybody was at the virtual meeting. And this is where I have to come in and say, remember, the virtual meeting is over. It was a separate process. The mail vote is a brand new process and it has to go to every single homeowner. If you don't send it to every single homeowner, it's not going to be a valid election. You're going to have to redo the whole thing. So keep that in mind. Be very clear that it has to go to every member entitled to vote. So what does the written ballot itself have to have? Well, obviously it has to contain a list of the candidates running. We know that. We need to contain, we need it to contain blanks for the write-in candidates. This is exactly the same as nominations from the floor. Remember I alluded to that earlier. So you need, so for example, if we have two positions up for election, have two blank lines where people can write in candidates because they can write in up to two. If you have three positions up for election, have three blank lines in addition to all the candidates. Uh, to afford homeowners an opportunity to write in who they think should be on the board. Then, in addition to the actual ballot, it needs to go with a solicitation letter. And the solicitation letter has to have more information in it. Well, it needs to tell you the number of responses needed to reach a quorum. Okay, so this is another area of confusion for people. Some folks have come to me and said, I don't get it, it's a mail ballot, what do you mean quorum? How does quorum even come into play with this? Well, legally quorum is the minimal amount of people we need to participate in something to be able to conduct business, any kind of business. So when you have a quorum requirement, and usually in your bylaws, this is the, this is the minimum number of homeowners that need to participate, either by being present at a meeting right? Or if there's no meeting, by voting in order to conduct business. So if it's 10% of your community and you have 100 homes, then 10 homeowners represent quorum. So it means you've got to have at least 10 people voting for this to be a valid election. Okay. So that's why you got to tell homeowners, this is how many votes we need to get for to reach quorum. Then you got to tell people percentage of approvals necessary for the candidate to be elected. Most of the time, it's whoever, you know, the two top two candidates receiving the highest number of votes will be elected, something like that. You also have to have a date and a time by which the ballot must be returned to be counted. If you don't have that, it is not going to be a ballot election because you will not have complied with the statutory requirements of a written ballot. So you got to tell people this is, you know, January 5th by 5 p.m. has to be received or it can't be counted. And then the last one is you have to add whatever written information is needed to allow the homeowners to make an informed decision. What does that mean? I think for elections, I would recommend you add in whatever you would have distributed at the, at the physical meeting or would have sent out as far as here are the descriptions of each of the candidates. Here's something they submitted. Here's information about them. If you have that, I would definitely include that. Uh, or else you might have someone challenging the basis of the election 
using a mail ballot by saying they didn't give me any information about any of the candidates and I had no idea so I couldn't make an informed decision. We don't want to be challenged on that basis. So include what you can as far as the candidates go. And then last but not least, you cannot revoke a written ballot unless, see, unless the bylaws specifically allow revocation. I honestly cannot think of a time where I have seen a set of bylaws that allowed that. Doesn't mean they don't exist, but it means they are very, very rare. So most likely you do not have anything like that in your bylaws. So for the most part, you just assume that people cannot revoke their written ballot. When we put these together, we check your bylaws and we will add a section that says, you know, by Colorado law, um, or a written ballot may not be revoked. And we will um, add that language in there so people know once we receive it, it's done. Okay. All right. So those are the requirements for these legal requirements for the written ballot. Now comes the hard part. Now we got to kind of separate things out as far as what's part of the meeting, what's part of the action by written ballot. So because again, people do kind of crisscross this and they get confused. So let's talk about meetings. We're including virtual, we're including in-person meetings, okay? So how can you as a homeowner attend a meeting? Well, you can show up in person if it's a physical meeting. You can attend by giving your proxy to someone and that's considered you attending legally. You can attend telephonically. What does that mean? Well, the Nonprofit Act says as long as you can hear everyone in the room and they can hear you, you're considered present at a meeting. So this very well applies to homeowner annual meetings. So again, if you have a physical meeting and somebody wants to phone in and be on a speakerphone, technically they're gonna be present. I don't know how they're gonna do a secret ballot vote though. They may not be able to, but they would be present. And obviously, you can attend virtually. So I think that's pretty clear. How can you vote at a meeting? So again, there's a physical ballot that we can use, usually when we have actual in-person meetings. You can vote by voice, right? You can vote by show of hands. And one bullet point I didn't put on here is you can vote electronically if, again, the association has a platform that allows for us to do that. So that's, that's the only way to attend and vote at a meeting. Okay, let's contrast this now to written ballots. As I said before, it's a separate action that is not part of a meeting. How do you attend a, an election? I don't want to say meeting. How do you attend an election that's being conducted by written ballot? Turn on your ballot. That's it. That's the only way. How can owners vote during an election by written ballot? Turn on your ballot. What about proxies? All right. I don't know if I, if I was specific enough in here with all the exclamation points and all the caps saying no proxies but no proxies. The thing to understand about proxies and mail ballots is they're mutually exclusive. They can never be used together. So it's usually, it's always gonna be one or the other. A proxy is only used when we are having a meeting. If we're not having a meeting, there is no right to a proxy. And let's think this through for a minute. It doesn't even make sense. Uh, to have proxies when we're doing a written ballot. A written ballot means every single homeowner gets mailed a ballot to vote. If they also got a proxy, how would that work? So I would say I'm not going to fill out my ballot. I'm going to give my proxy to my neighbor, Jeff. Jeff's going to fill out my ballot and send it in for me. That doesn't make sense. Every homeowner, because we're not holding a meeting, you don't have to worry about showing up either virtually or in any way, shape or form you have your own ballot. You can vote it or you cannot vote it, period, end of story. So there's no room here to have a proxy. Okay, a proxy is 
when you can't attend a meeting and you want someone there to vote for you, uh, to take action for you, and to count towards quorum. With a written ballot, only the ballots count towards quorum. There are no proxies. So do I need to make that clear what I wrote no proxies? Hopefully not. Um, so don't get confused by that. And by the same token, we also don't want to see uh, a mail ballot or we don't want to see a virtual or me physical meeting where you're, where you're sending out absentee ballots. No, no, no. There, there is nothing in either Kai or the Nonprofit Act that allows for that. So what you're sending out instead are proxies for those people who cannot be at the meeting. Okay, I gotta tell you, I absolutely love this thing at the bottom here about the therapist and the husband because I can totally see my husband doing this. But I'm just saying, I'm sure, hopefully some of you are laughing because I think it's hilarious. But anyway, as I said before, uh, proxy versus written ballot, mutually exclusive. If you are seeing a community where you're seeing mail ballots go out, you're seeing proxies go out, red flags should be going up in your mind going, wait a minute, something is not right here. And that's when you probably want to give a call to the community's legal counsel and say, "What's what are we doing wrong here, if anything? Why, why am I seeing both of these? Uh, I know there are some associations right now that want to save on the cost of mailing, right? They don't want to mail out the the meeting invitation, and then after that, mail out you know the, the mailing for the written ballot. And so they're trying to do everything in, in one fall swoop. And what they're doing is they're sending out a package of stuff. It's a, so it's the meeting notice, but it also has the secret ballot in there. And they're saying you got to vote the secret ballot. Um, and we have to receive it before the election. So it's a mail ballot, but it's all part of the same package. And then we'll announce the results at the, at the virtual annual meeting, which legally you can do, but I've seen a lot of people get very confused about that. Um, and I've seen it go horribly wrong. So if that's something you are thinking of doing, please, please, please work with your Legal counsel for the association, I'm doing that because so many things can go wrong so many times. And, and personally, I recommend against it. I think you do it separately uh, because there's no easier way to confuse people than by putting a whole bunch of papers in an envelope and saying, here, figure out what's what. Um, kind of the other thing I, I forgot to mention but would like to mention now is with your written ballot, because it is a secret ballot, you should be using the old double envelope system. And that is kind of like what we all just experienced for those of us who uh, voted by mail uh, at, during the presidential election, um, that you have a system where you are going to put your ballot in a blank envelope and your ballot is blank. And then you're gonna put that envelope in an addressed envelope, right? That's going either to the management company or wherever the ballots go and it's got your address on the outside of the envelope. So when I, as a community manager, receive the envelope, I see your address, I'm gonna mark it off, saying this person's voted, I'm gonna take out the blank envelope, throw it in a pile with all my other blank envelopes to count later, and then I'm gonna take this envelope with your address and put it in a separate pile as proof that I did receive a ballot from you. So again, when we talk about delivering the mail ballots to homeowners, the reason I don't think you can do it via email is because how are you gonna get them the envelopes? Are you gonna make them do their own envelopes? Because that's a disaster waiting to happen. And so it's almost like you have to mail it or hand deliver it because your packet should include the mail ballot. It should include a blank envelope to put your mail ballot in. It should include a return envelope. Hopefully you're including instructions uh, for your homeowners how to fill it all out and what goes where because it is very very confusing So at a minimum we should have those things um, So be careful I do encourage boards and community managers to work with legal counsel when you're doing all these You know mail ballot voting because it's not a one-size-fits-all 
I wouldn't be taking um, something that, you know, any attorney drafted for one of your other communities and then pasting and copying it to this specific community because they do have to be customized. Everyone has different requirements and I would be extremely careful with that. Um, so that's that. But before we get to questions, the wise Morgan Freeman has something to say. It really is horrible advice. I know. <sighs> All right, so you guys know the dancing chicken, you know the dancing pig, if you've been in any of my classes or webinars. I'm gonna go through uh, the questions starting from the bottom going up, and I think hopefully we have enough time to get through all of them. So, first question is, can you email a ballot? Uh, if it's a secret ballot, I don't think you can email it because we identify who it comes from. And we have to be able to identify who the mailing is coming from so we can mark that person off as having voted, but we can't um, have the secret ballot as part of the email because now we know. And sometimes people say, well, it's just the manager. They don't care. No, nobody can know. I don't care if it's the community manager or the attorney. Nobody should know. So, uh, no, you really can't mail uh, an email ballot or a mail ballot. What if the board term is only one year per the bylaws? <clears throat> Yeah, and unfortunately that does happen. So with respect to, if you're talking about staggering the terms, you would need uh, an amendment to your bylaws, changing the terms uh, to allow for staggering. And again, that is something you would wanna discuss with the association's legal counsel because uh, there's a process for amending bylaws and when you're changing terms, you have to have homeowner approval. So. Uh, I would talk to the attorney about that one. Um, if a builder is still the declarant, uh, are board positions still staggered or do they become staggered after the builder has turned over the community? Um, <clears throat> honestly, the Condominium Act does not distinguish between builder you know, controlled or declarant controlled communities or not. However, I suspect when you have a declarant controlled board and you don't have a whole lot of homeowners in the community, nobody's going to bring it up or challenge it that you don't have staggered terms. Um, so it will pretty much go unnoticed. But, but the statute doesn't differentiate between, you know, a declared controlled versus homeowner controlled community. How about someone in the management office, but not the manager counting ballots? Again, I, I think we can easily and logically say that as a neutral third party, and I don't have a problem with it when we're talking about the mail ballots. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing it if we have a physical meeting and there's actually homeowners in the audience. I'd recommend we get the homeowners uh, and get some volunteers to count at that point. For secret ballots, can these be tabulated prior to the meeting, i.e., as they come in? If so, can the board know the results prior to the annual meeting? And this is exactly what I was just talking about. This is a situation where you have, um, you're doing an election by mail ballot, but you're announcing the results at the annual meeting. So again, you wanna be very careful in how that packet goes out because your, your mail ballot package has to still comply with all those requirements we talked about when it comes uh, to the mail ballots. So you still have to have all that information in there. You still have to have the envelopes, right? And then <clears throat> at the same time, you're holding an actual annual meeting virtually, so now you have a meeting notice that also needs to go out. So if you're sending everything out in one envelope, you really got to be clear that this is two separate things we're doing. Um, but to answer the question is, yeah, you can definitely have <clears throat> the mail ballots be due either the morning of the annual meeting or the day before the annual meeting, and you count it up before, and then you announce the annual meeting, here's the results of the election. So yeah, you can absolutely do that. You just want to be, like I said, very careful in the process itself. If you have two candidates for one vacant position at the virtual meeting, then after the meeting is adjourned, one of those candidates rescinds their candidacy. Are we, sorry, are we 
required to go through the mail-in vote process to ensure a valid election. Yeah, I think you are because unless you are planning on calling another virtual meeting uh, and having an election there and still allowing nominations from the floor, you do have to send out the mail ballot and you do still have to leave a blank for a write-in candidate. Now, chances are you're just going through the motions and that person's gonna get elected, but you can't do an acclamation when we don't have a meeting. So unfortunately, you do still have to go through that or you gotta call another special meeting for the purpose of electing that position. So it's very unfortunate and you know that's that sometimes happens and it's because people don't understand what they're doing when they nominate themselves. Um, can an HOA send out nomination applications prior to the meeting asking for members to return if they are interested? They have the written ballot, sorry, they have the written ballot prior to the meeting. So I think that's um, you know the same question we just answered, which is, yeah, if you're doing a separate mail ballot vote, then yeah, but that's its own process. It, it has nothing to do with the meeting, and we just set the deadline to be before the meeting. Can an association hold the annual meeting entirely by mail? Um, well, if you're doing something by, by mail, I don't think you're holding a meeting, you're taking action. And what do you do by taking action you're electing? So, you know, an annual meeting traditionally to me means there's some discussion. The homeowners get to talk about the things they want to talk about. It's their meeting. It's not just, you know, a it's not just a gathering for the purpose of electing and that's it. Uh, so to me, I wouldn't consider that an annual meeting, but I would consider it the election. All right. <clears throat> Is it, no, sorry, if it is a virtual meeting, does there have to be a physical location? So, Kiowa has a requirement that the meeting notice, any meeting notice of the members has to have a location. So we recommend that your meeting notice contain the physical location for the meeting host, usually it's gonna be the management company, but make it very clear that the attendance can only be virtual. This is just the location of the host. You can only attend virtually. So I think, yes, I would put that in there because we don't want someone objecting to the validity of this meeting because we don't have a location in there at Kiowa says location. Uh, can you repeat about the return envelopes? Sure. Uh, so if you're doing a secret written ballot, mail ballot, you are going to need a mechanism by which homeowners return that ballot to you and you don't know who it's from, but at the same time, we can mark off that a homeowner voted so we can ensure nobody votes more than once. So the way we recommend doing it is you get uh, a blank envelope and, and an unadvised unidentifiable ballot that's filled out and put in the blank envelope. So you have a sealed blank envelope. You don't know who it's from. It's got the ballot inside. We, you know, and we can't identify who it's from. Then that, that, that envelope has to go into another envelope that gets sent to where, to the management company or whoever's collecting the ballots. Um, and then when you get, as the community manager, you get this envelope, you have, you know who it came from because it's got a return address and you can mark that off your list. This person voted and then you open it up. You take out the blank envelope, right? That has the ballot in it, but no identifying marks. And you can put that blank envelope aside to be opened later on. And it's going to be in a pile with all these other blank envelopes that you received. So you're not going to know which envelope, you know, return envelope goes with it because you put the return envelope in another pile. Uh, so that's essentially the, the secret but double envelope mailing. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, if the bylaws are silent on timing of elections, can elections be held either at the same time as the annual meeting or at a different time? It sounds like you, sorry, sounds like you recommend two separate times to avoid confusion between the meeting and the election. Well, it's not a matter of time. When you do a mail ballot, there has to be 
a, a voting period that's, good, I would say, at least seven to 10 days long. Um, because you have to give people an opportunity to receive the envelope, to mark their ballot, and then mail the envelope back, right? So it's not going to be like you have to vote today. It's going to be, here's your ballot. We need to receive it, you know, whatever, this date for it to count. And then we, once we have all the ballots received, then we count them. So what I'm saying is um, if you want to do a mail vote, and you want to be able to announce the results of the mail vote at the annual meeting, then your solicitation for the votes has to go out, you know, at least, I would say at least 10 to 15 days before so that homeowners have enough time to fill it out and submit it which is why some associations are sending these solicitations out in the same envelope as the invitation to the annual meeting. But you still have to understand that they're two separate things legally. And it's, it's very hard for homeowners to separate that out and it gets muddled. And that's when things go wrong because homeowners think that the ballot is to vote at the meeting and it's not. Um, so it gets very confusing. If you use online voting platform like Vote HOA now, uh, are you required to send out the secret secret ballots as well? No, if you well, if you're using that online voting platform during your annual meeting, then no, you don't need to send out the mail ballots. Um, if you are wanting people to do the vote outside of the meeting by go, by logging on to that platform and voting then, I think you, uh, you would still have to send out the packet and in, the ballot would simply be the instruction to go to this, you know, here's the website or here, here's the, you know, login information and website and you need to go there to, you know, draw it to, to do your ballot. And then you still have to have the same information on it. This is by when it has to be received, you know, uh, or it can't count. And all the other information as far as uh, what's quorum, how do people get elected, what does the count have to be? Goodness gracious, I don't know if we've got enough time. Uh, do you mail ballots to homeowners who are not eligible to vote due to delinquency? No. Um, the statute says you only mail that to owner, owners who are eligible to vote. If, if you've got homeowners that are not eligible to vote because of delinquency or whatnot, then you don't have to mail it to them. The board wants to know how the secret ballots are being voted, i.e., who is in the lead with the highest number of votes prior to the deadline uh, for submittal membership. Can this information be given to them? Um, well, my First of all, the board is entitled to whatever information it wants. It's the board. It is the corporation. That's the body that makes all the decisions. So you don't ever deny information or documentation to the board. It's the board's discretion. Uh, you know, who gets what information, but the board gets all the information. So, however, best practices in my book is you don't open the ballots until the dead after the deadline because that's exactly what you want to avoid, is people reviewing them and then saying, oh, well, I'm gonna go knock on so-and-so's door because I, you know, I don't see that they voted yet. And you know, so I, I would uh, just make a, po a po policy, a practice, that we don't open ballots until after the voting deadline, and then we do it. If a written ballot election is held, uh, before the annual meeting, would the sorry would that violate the bylaws that allow for nominations from the floor? No, because what you would do is you would leave in blanks for write-in candidates, and that's our nominations from the floor. So homeowners can still put someone else on the ballot in in those blanks. So no, we don't violate that. To be clear, are ballots to be mailed to everyone regardless if there is an in-person meeting or a virtual meeting? No. No, if you have an in-person meeting, you don't ever, you're not gonna mail ballots. Remember, if 
you're having a physical meeting and people are voting there, we're, we're only using proxies. We're not, ballots cannot be mailed out when we have a physical meeting. So no, it's not going to be, they're not going to be mailed to everyone regardless. All right. How can you collect ballots and announce the new board members when you still have to allow nominations from the floor? That person would not be on the ballot to earn votes. So again, the way we do that is by leaving blanks in the ballots toward and allowing write-in candidates. Okay. So that's how we would do it. Um, so, and that I think is the last question. So yay. Thanks guys. I appreciate uh, everyone's participation and you listening in on this and hopefully this has clarified it a little bit. If not, there's my email. Please, you know, feel free to shoot me an email. I'll do the best I can to try and further explain things to you. Thanks everyone. Have a great day. Stay safe.